Hello and where to begin? I'm Martin McNeil, currently a fourth year law student, formerly an editorial and commercial photographer, but mostly I'm a full-time dad to three boys. I'm the guy that my dogs like to ragdoll a little and take them out for walks. And I'm married to an awesome woman who's put up with my puns and deadpan dad jokes for over 20 years now. I'm not going to show you pictures of my wife or kids because who does that? Besides, it wouldn't be relevant to what I have to say. Most of you watching this will know that on August 6th of this year, I found myself in a situation that came out of left field regarding a YouTube video and some tweets that preceded and followed it. And in the wake of all that, there's been a lot of wild speculation, wilder allegations and some frankly unsavoury stuff which I won't waste my breath on. But it's now time to address a few things that have been put out over the last few days and weeks. Before I get into it, I want to start out by saying that for at least 12 years now, I've been a very vocal artist rights advocate, particularly on the issues of artists being paid fairly, in full and on time. More importantly, I've spoken frequently about the need for those in creative industries to be respectful of each other's work and rights. It's a big part of why I ended up starting my law studies with a view to advocacy and consultancy regarding intellectual property rights and law lecturing as my day job to support that work. I'm old enough to remember the days before Napster when the internet was a place where creative works were shared around on platforms such as CompuServe, AOL, Usenet bulletin boards, largely without ill intent. But even back then, people began to realise that even the best of intentions can sometimes give rise to consequences that lean towards the negative. When I started out in editorial photography, Facebook was barely on the scene, Twitter hadn't yet been launched, and Instagram was a few years away from existing. Even YouTube was the new kid on the block, an independent company that wouldn't be bought out by Google until late of 2006. These social media services, which encourage the sharing of images, videos and other media, are corporate entities headquartered in the United States and they make use of an exam not an example, an exemption that was carved out in law back in 1998, the DMCA. In simple terms, if these services expeditiously remove any copyright content from their platforms at the request of a rights holder, they can't then be sued by the owners of that media. That's a core function of the DMCA, which has survived intact for almost 25 years now. This is relevant because if we fast forward to July 31st of this year, I found one of my photographs had been used in a video that had been published on a YouTube account titled Top Hat Gaming Man Channel. At first glance, there was no real-world name or address to be found on the About page for that channel. So, despite the channel being clearly monetized, I filed a DMCA takedown notice just after 6pm that day. And its past experience of trying to contact channel owners directly has been... Uh, let's just say there's no matter how polite and professional I am when asking, the replies I get are rarely you know, mirror that tone. On uh, nothing more than a hunch, I went back again the next day to have another look over the channel and used the email address that was published there as a basis for a web search. That soon led to me finding out that Top Hat Gaming Man was a pseudonym for a Mr. Richard Varty, who was represented by a YouTuber talent agency called Colossal Influence. A search of company's house turned up an address for this agency, so I typed up a letter requesting payment of a standard licensing fee for the use of my photograph in Mr. Varty's video. And I sent that letter via sign for service just after 4pm that day. For anyone out there thinking about whether it's lawful to use two processes in parallel, the simple answer is yeah. A DMCA takedown notification is a provision of US law, I've already said, and it has a functional equi equivalent of a cease and desist. The host, YouTube in this instance, must comply with it. Because if they don't, they can end up in a situation where they can be sued for what's called vicarious liability. And that's not a position that Google, Twitter, Facebook or others want to find themselves in. And whilst a cease and desist plays the role of stopping the use of someone's work from continuing, any artist is quite within their rights to also ask for fair payment for the use of work that occurred up to the date that it stops being used. And I'd like you to keep that fact in mind as I move on. As it turned out, my letter to Class and Influence Limited wasn't signed as received until 9.47am on the morning of August 6th. I have obviously no clue as to why or how it took five days for a first-class post letter to be delivered, when the average time is two. Suffice to say that the fact that my letter arrived on a Saturday morning 
after being sent on a Monday afternoon was so far out of my ability to plan or control, it's ridiculous to even contemplate it. When I woke up that day just after 11am, I fast became aware of two things. Firstly, that I had both a Twitter mention and a separate DM from someone called Lady Decade. And second, that at 9.31am, YouTube had acted on my DMCA takedown notification and disabled the video in which my work had been used by Mr Varty. Again, a situation outside my control because, in my experience, YouTube can take hours, days or weeks to action a DMCA takedown request. So for it to happen on a Saturday morning was purely coincidental. Remember how I said that I'd learned from experience that dealing with responses to asking people to stop using my work can be a bit of a bumpy ride? A few of the things that Chloe Varty, also known as Lady Decade, said to me in their Twitter DM proved my gut instincts and led to me insisting on dealing with the situation in writing. After closing off the conversation, I really thought that Mr and Mrs Varty would take stock and get some advice either from their management agency or wait a few days to get an initial consultation with a solicitor to learn that yes, everything in my letter was both above board and followed the process expected under UK law. After all, my letter allowed ample time for that to happen. Nothing could have prepared me for what kicked off around 10.30pm that night. The barrage of activity in my email inbox and Twitter mentions soon clued me into what had taken place. The Varties had uploaded a 20 minute long video to YouTube that, in my opinion, deliberately misrepresented both my claims and my correspondence. And it didn't take long for their followers to pick up the virtual pitchforks. There was abuse directed at me. There were attempts to intimidate me into retracting my claims. There were threats against me and my family. There were even at least two instances where people tried to dox my home address. And those communications were quickly passed on to Police Scotland, who have put in requests with ISPs to find out the identities of those responsible so they can take further action. You see, in her video, Chloe Varty was quite careful not to mention my name directly, but she did include just enough detail that anyone with a search engine could easily do so. In UK law, this is termed jigsaw identification and is often cited in contempt of court actions or defamation cases. Many cases have held that this form of identifying someone is functionally identical to straight up naming them directly. It also appears that at some point on August 7th, Mrs Varty was more concerned about the potential for the abuse that her followers and fans were directing at me, somehow landing back on our doorstep. She said in a Discord chat group, please do not contact or harass this guy from this Discord. He could sue me for targeted harassment. As I understand it, that Discord group had about 500 members, but no similar statements were made to any of Mr or Mrs Varty's various social media channels. The video that they made together remained very much live and was subsequently republished in part or whole by other YouTube accounts who took the Varty's narrative at face value without question, repeating and amplifying it. For several days, the Varty's were seemingly content for their narrative to be circulated and shared, whilst I remained silent, and for good reason. If you ask any lawyer or law lecturer what you should do in the middle of a civil dispute, 99% of them will reply that you should STFU and say nothing. The other 1% will slap you upside the head for even asking and then tell you that, as attorneys Mark and Craig Wasserman routinely say, every day is shut the up Friday. You see, anything that you say publicly during a civil dispute is something that can and probably will end up going on the record. So if you're on the receiving end of a legal claim, you can quickly find yourself in a worse position than the one you initially started off at if you go talking about it. In the modern age, publicly means any kind of communication broadly directed at a third party. So that naturally covers social media postings such as tweets, Discord chats, YouTube videos, and so on. If you're watching and now wondering, hang about, why did you upload this video then? That'll become clearer in a moment. Getting back on track, the first I heard back from the Varties was a letter that arrived through my front door on the morning of August 11th. And you'll note it was dated August 8th. A redacted personally, identi uh, personally identifiable information. But you'll see that it's brief and to the point. It's not on any kind of headed paper, nor is it from a firm of solicitors. But none of those points are relevant for civil claims in the UK because the court system encourages people to settle disputes directly where they can. And you don't need a solicitor to do that. The part I'm going to talk about is this. 
Having read your letter and reviewed the footage without any admission of liability, we are prepared to agree to pay the requested amount of £470.52. This is in full and final settlement of all claims that either party may have against each other connected to or relating to this. And that seems quite reasonable at first glance, right? Except there's one small problem. Now, using this wording, Mr and Mrs Varty presented a counter-offer to my August 1st letter, stating that if I accept payment from them on their terms, it will cover any and all claims any party may have, etc. Given the date of the letter, their terms would have covered claims I might have relating to tweets, the Discord chats, the YouTube video that they'd uploaded on August 6th, and so on. Simply put, if I accepted their claims, the settlement would no longer be just about them using my photographic work without advanced consent. And that's something I couldn't agree to, particularly because their August 6th video was the genesis of a torrent of abuse directed at me, not to mention that many of the statements made in the video did not accurately reflect the facts of the matter and, in my opinion, crossed over a line into defamation. On the morning of August 15th, I sent a reply to Mr and Mrs Varty expressly rejecting their offer. I'm not going to publish that letter here because it relates to what I view as an ongoing matter. All I'll say is that I informed the Vartys that any settlement offer would now have to take all the facts to date into consideration. On the heels of sending that letter, the very next day, I received an email from a firm of solicitors who stated that they'd been retained by the Vartys and that any correspondence from that point on had to go through them. I thought I'd be dealing with competent, legally trained professionals and in fairness, most of the correspondence between myself and the firm of solicitors was as I expected. Polite, to the point and working towards resolving the situation. On the afternoon of August 22nd, I had an email where the solicitor asked for my bank details because they would be making recommendations for payment in relation to this matter. A reasonable enough request, so I sent them my bank details and quite unexpectedly and with no formal settlement or agreement in place, the law firm that made a direct payment of £470.52 into my bank account about 3.30pm on August 25th. Immediately I called up the firm to let them know there must be a mistake. There's been no settlement agreement. And to say that the reception staff were evasive would be an understatement, telling me it wasn't possible to talk to the Varty solicitor and I had to wait until they emailed me. Two hours later I got an email claiming that the payment had been made per the terms of my August 1st letter and that the matter was now settled. So what's the problem you might be thinking? Well, to answer that question, we need to talk about an old contract law case in English law known as Hyde v. Wrench, a precedent that was set nearly 182 years ago and is still mentioned in court cases to this day. The case went like this. Mr Wrench owned farmland and was willing to sell it to Mr Hyde for £1,200, which is about £94,000 today if we adjust for inflation. Mr Hyde thought the asking price was too high and declined to accept. Mr. The Wrench then replied offering the land for sale at a reduced price of £1,000 and waited for Mr. Hyde to respond. Mr. Hyde, through his solicitor, said he'd be willing to pay £950 for the farmland, but Mr. Wrench thought that offer was too low and refused to sell. Hyde then wrote back saying that he was now happy to pay the £1,000 asking price that Mr. Wrench had previously offered, but Mr. Wrench never got back to him. Sometime later, Hyde took Wrench to court in an attempt to force Wrench to sell the land to him for the thousand pound price. And the court basically said, not so fast. When you made your counter offer of 950 pounds, that extinguished Mr. Wrench's earlier 1000 pounds offer to you. It simply ceased to exist. You can't turn back the clock to the past and force Mr. Wrench to accept an offer that doesn't exist anymore. In the same way, the Varty solicitor tried to reach back in time to my August 1st letter, ignoring everything that happened since, and tried to claim that paying me the amount I'd asked for meant the situation was closed. I mean, Cher once lamented in song that she couldn't turn back time, and Johnny Hates Jazz beat her to that sentiment a year earlier, admittedly a little differently, since they wanted to turn back the clock and stop those wheels of time. If musicians know that it's not possible, how didn't the solicitor for the Varties get that memo? <laughs> Joking aside, I may only be a fourth year law student, but even I knew their solicitor's tactics weren't supported by facts because of the Hyde precedent. But despite phone calls, emails and letters stating as much, the firm of solicitors refused to send me information that would allow me to return the money. The only reply I got was on August 26 from the Varty solicitor who said, and I quote, 
I am not instructed to deal with the points of dispute that you are now raising. If you wish to raise the claim in relation to intellectual property, copyright, then you are, of course, at liberty to do so. Now, in my opinion, that statement can be read as the firm knowing that their actions did not settle the matter. But instead, they hoped that paying the fee as originally offered would be enough to cause me to back down. Or maybe at the time of making the payment, they thought I wouldn't know about the precedent set in Hyde. Even though every first year law student around the world, studying contract law basics, are taught about this case. Because the solicitors had used the UK Fasters payment system, even my own bank didn't have the information on the account that the payment had come from. So I was at a dead end. Ultimately, I had no choice but to contact the parties directly and let them know that, from a moral, ethical and legal standpoint, the money had to be returned to them. Because of the postal strikes that plagued the UK recently and the backlog of mail clogging up the system, they were sent a PDF copy of the letter by email at 10am on September 22nd, restating all the facts and giving them a choice to either send me bank account details, PayPal, Venmo, whatever, that would allow me to return the money to them, or if they didn't reply, that I donate the £470.52 to the Clacton Food Bank in their name and consider the money de facto returned to them by that means. I asked for their reply no later than 5pm on October 7th, and since that time has now been and gone without response, I have gone ahead and made the donation I said I would. And evidence of that payment will have been sent to the parties by the time this video went live. Where does that leave the situation right now? In English law, you've generally got six years in which to bring a claim for damages in tort through the courts. Those limits are set out in the Limitation Act 1980, though some matters like theft, personal injury, defamation, etc., they have their own separate limits. That's just a few examples. Personally, I remain optimistic that the parties will open up a dialogue and, this time, take into account all the facts and circumstances starting from April 4th of 2021 through to the present day. On February 20th of this year, Chloe Varty tweeted out, Freedom of speech doesn't mean freedom from consequence. So I hope she takes her own words to heart and stands ready to address the consequences that flowed from the things that both she and her husband have variously said from early August onwards. Because there should be consequences when people very publicly claim somebody else is a scammer, a financial predator, a copyright troll, and so on, without any factual basis for those words, especially when those words are then repeated by many others, again with no regard to fact or truth. As I said early on in this video, I'm a very vocal advocate for the rights of all artists and creators. You could almost say that copyright is a necessity for artists to earn a living, gracious or otherwise. And I wanted to take a moment to talk about that before closing out. The very first copyright law to be written, the Statute of Anne, which came into force on April 10th of 1710, said in its introduction, Whereas printers, booksellers and other persons have of late frequently taken the liberty of printing, reprinting and publishing, or causing to be printed, reprinted and published, books and other writings, without the consent of the authors or proprietors of such books and writings, to their very great detriment, and too often to the ruin of them and their families. This law recognised that people who had the technical means to reproduce the work of authors without their consent was ruinous to the very people who created the writings being copied. Artists of all kinds generally just want to do good work, and when someone else wants to make use of it, it's the artist that gets to set the terms of that use. If asked, they may be happy to simply be credited, request a modest fee in return. But that consent has to be gained in advance to be legitimate, and sometimes the answer will be no, possibly with an explanation given for the refusal, but that's not necessary and can't be demanded. It also bears mentioning that, like many other situations in life, silence does not equal consent. If you ask and don't get a reply, charging ahead and using an artist's work, regardless, might create more trouble for you down the line. So when an artist's refusal to give consent goes ignored, or if they discover that the work has been used without an attempt to get consent beforehand, it's not copyright trolling when artists then use any lawful process to assert their rights. Whether that's sending a DMCA takedown notice, requesting a credit, sending a cease and desist, or even saying, hey, you've used my work, you're going to need to pay me or any combination of the options open to them. That's their choice. And on that point, crediting an artist when you've used their work without consent 
does nothing except indicate where you found that work. The source itself might not have been a lawful use, and having a credit line won't get you off the hook from an infringement claim. This brings me to the extremely misunderstood concept of fair use, or fair dealing as it's known in some countries. Yes, there are exceptions in law that sometimes give you the right to make use of a copyright work without asking. And those exceptions tend to be very narrow and when an artist and end user disagree on whether a use is fair or not, it's the courts that make the determination. Nobody else. Platforms like YouTube, Twitter, Facebook, so on, can't decide if a use is fair because if they try to, they could wind up getting sued. Again, vicarious liability. Fair use or fair dealing is a bit like punching someone in the face and then trying to claim you were acting in self-defense. Just saying it isn't an instant Uno reverse card or get a jail free card or a magical mythical spell where you can add a disclaimer to your website, videos or whatever saying no copyright intended or all materials used here fall under fair use. Because frankly, that has about as much weight in law as a helium filled balloon whose string has come undone. For clarity, all I'm saying is that the process of putting forward the legal defense of fair use is broadly similar to claiming self-defense, just in case anyone feels the urge to twist my words into something they're not or quote them out of context. And that seems as good a note as any to finish up on. I hope this clears the air somewhat. And I know some of the things I've said may create questions on your minds, but right now, this is as far as I'm publicly willing to go regarding any statement of my position. Thanks for listening.